For our second message today, we have a sermon from Mr. Matthew Steele entitled, A Mighty Man of Valor. Mr. Steele. Thank you, Reg. Well, hello. It feels like uh, we're all getting affected by the weather today, doesn't it? It's just a little slow, a little sleepy. Maybe uh, one of those days that we really want to stay in bed. No? Get out and about. Well, I'm glad that we can still do that. Uh, because, you know, certainly there are parts of the country that uh, that's becoming uh, less and less uh, able to do that. And, and so we're, we're definitely need to enjoy it uh, while we can. You know, it was about three, well, four, three to four generations or so, after the children of Israel left Egypt and in that great Exodus story, and and then about three generations from when they started to conquer the land and and to subdue those that had had been there and were supposed to be eliminating those different tribes and nations that had been in the land ahead of them. And, you know, That's a long enough time for uh, things to start to get forgotten, isn't it? You know, so this is like the equivalent of uh, not my parents, but my grandparents. Uh, They were the ones that entered into the land, and they were young when they entered into the land. But they had they had stories, didn't they, of what God had done? You know, because they had grown up, uh, like Joshua and others, had grown up in the wilderness and seeing God's miracles and seeing how he provided for Israel every, every day, every morning, morning by morning, giving them their daily bread. And so many different promises <clears throat> fulfilled in their lifetime. And, and so, you know, generations go by and eventually you, you lose that knowledge, don't you? You remember the stories, but those that were alive didn't really experience those wonders. And so we get to a period of time that we call the judges. And uh, Israel is in a very dark place. Uh, As I said, it was in a period of the time that we call the judges. A time when Israel had no human king, right? Who's for that today? I'm for that today. No more kings. No more congressmen and senators and presidents. God was king, right? He was supposed to be their king. And, and interacting, and they were supposed to be interacting with him as their king. And so here we are, we're, we're just find Israel ruled by judges. And the judges that, they weren't just judging, were they? They weren't just deciding, okay, no, they're his camels and they're your sheep and, and finding people for misdemeanors. They were actually bringing judgment uh, on the enemies of Israel. And and through God's strength, they were defending the nation. And so we get to this time. And then this one particular judge comes to the fore. And his name was Gideon. Now, it's no accident that I'm talking about Gideon today because the ladies are about to do a Bible study on Gideon, and so I thought it would be appropriate, and uh, I am sure that it's going to be just a, a fantastic study from, from the material I've seen thus far. It's going to be really, really good. But this this guy, we don't think about it in these terms, but this guy struck fear into the heart of the enemies of Israel. And if you read the story of Gideon, you'll you'll see that. And uh, especially when later, and I'm not going to touch on it today, but when Gideon sneaks down into the camp of the Midianites and he hears them talking about how the sword of Gideon is out there and that they're afraid. And so, you know, in the days before we have social media and you can't go viral with things, nonetheless, Gideon gets a name for himself, as it were. He becomes this powerful figure and uh, brings a lot of fear to the enemies of Israel. 
He was a man, as I said. He was a judge. And he gave comfort and hope to a a traumatized nation, a bludgeoned and beaten people. You know, we've all been experiencing uh, increased anxiety, haven't we? From one reason or another in and around the, the coronavirus, whether it's the virus itself, whether it's government actions, whether it's face masks and not face masks, and the politics surrounding all of those things. And it's just raised that level of anxiety, and we've, we've talked about that. But then there's also deeper anxiety for those that have lost jobs. They've lost their livelihood because their, uh, their position was eliminated due to the lockdowns and, and the lack of business in certain sectors of the economy. So we, we have very real anxiousness and, and stresses on people's lives and on their families. They are real. But they are nothing in comparison to the condition we find Israel in during a seven-year period of oppression by the Midianites. We find the situation described in Judges chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. It says, Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian for seven years. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel. Because of the the Midianites, the children of Israel made for themselves uh, the dens, and the caves and the strongholds which are in the mountains. So it was, whenever Israel had sown, Midian, the Midianites would come up, also the Amalekites, and the people of the east would come up against them, and they would encamp against them and destroy the produce of the earth as far as Gaza, and left no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep, nor ox, nor donkey, for they would come up with their livestock and their tents, coming in as numerous as locusts, both they and their camels were without number, and they would enter the land to destroy it. Could you imagine that? You know, we have at times this last year been a little bit stressed, you know, about, um, you know, when the lockdowns first started happening, you remember all the toilet paper that disappeared, right? And other food items and so on. And it's, Un- unknown. Is this going to keep happening? Are these things going to keep getting worse? This was far better. Far worse, I should say. Far worse. We have it, we've had it much better than what Israel experienced. You know, the idea of uh, maybe hiding out in a cave for a little camping trip, maybe a you know, 13-year-old boy might think that's pretty cool. We can kind of camp in the cave and Make sure it's not occupied, you know, by a bear or two. Don't want to wake up and be somebody's breakfast in the morning. But think about hundreds of people hiding in the mountain in caves. And then think about thousands of people. And think about the sanitary condition. Alone. And then how are you getting water? And where is the food coming from? I imagine during that seven-year period, the, the wild animals, deer, and whatever else would have been in and around that area was probably decimated, just hunting to survive for seven years. And then, as you watch from the mountainside, from your, your den, your cave, You see these hordes of Midianites and Amalekites and others come along in and camp where you have planted your grain. And they just eat all of it. They just take it. And then their herds just decimate every single little bit of green plant on the ground. That's what Israel was going through for seven years. Just as the Bible said, it was a swarm of locusts. Just taking away the resources that Israel needed to survive. I just couldn't imagine seven years of that. I, I, (laughs) 
my darker moments thinking about, oh, an economic collapse and we can't get food. I don't know if we'd survive seven months. You know, we all live on postage stamps with our house and a little front yard and a backyard and how are we going to feed ourselves? We need more land to feed ourselves. So this was nothing short than national trauma. I mean, this is just awful situation. It says in verse 6, So Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites. And the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. And it came to pass that when the children of Israel cried out to the Lord because of the Midianites, that the Lord sent a prophet to the children of Israel who said to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you out of the house of bondage and I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all who oppressed you and drove them out before you and gave you their land. Also I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice. And you know, they did more than just not obey. They adopted those gods and said, okay, if we follow those gods, then, then that'll keep us safe in this land. They adopted those false gods. But when they finally cried out, it's interesting, God made sure that they understood why they were being punished. They cried out, and then he told them through the prophet why this was happening, why they were being punished. It was a corrective measure. It was a means by which God was getting their attention and saying, hey, (laughs) you didn't keep up with your side of this bargain, this promise that we made to one another, that if I blessed you, you would would honor me and and serve me and be a, a peculiar and special people to me. They didn't do that. So God's corrective measure worked, didn't it? They called out to him. They cried out to him, and then he granted them mercy. He didn't just send fire down from heaven, though. Anybody wish he would just solve problems like that? You know? Just, Just solve it. Just fix it. Make it go away. But he doesn't do it like that. He just doesn't. We have to be involved. We have to be involved in that work of redemption, salvation, and and the protection that he will then provide through that for us. Just like so many times before with Moses, Joshua, Deborah, God required Israel to act and follow his instructions in obedience and faith, which is the same for us. And we don't like that. We want God to just do it. We're, we're love each end of a spectrum, aren't we? We're just, no, I want to do it, or, oh, that didn't work, and I'm in trouble. How about you just do it? And God brings us together with him. says, no, we're going to do this together. So then what happens? Working with him, okay? Taking action, following his direction and guidance, which is, The reason that he brought the correction in the first place, isn't it? Because they were not listening to him. And oftentimes, we were not listening to him. Step out in faith with him. Take some risk. Make some effort. And then he magnifies the effect. And I think this is what we see with Gideon. Uh, I think Mark talked about Gideon just a few few weeks ago. Feels like a few weeks ago. Almost a year ago. It was like yesterday. Um, but, you know, Gideon is, um, is kind of unusual in, in some ways, but then very, uh, very typical uh, also in other ways of how, how God works with us. So here he is. He's threshing wheat in a wine press. And I remember Mark talking about that. It's like, that's the wrong device. It's for wine, it's for grapes, not for threshing wheat. And that's where we find him. And so in Judges chapter 6 and verse 11, it says, Now the angel of the Lord came down and sat under the 
Terebinth tree, which was in Ophara, which belonged to Joash the uh, Abazite. And while his son uh, Gideon threshed wheat in the winepress in order to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. And Gideon said to him, O oh my Lord, if, if the Lord's with us, why then has all this happened to us? And you remember what I mentioned before, you know. Gideon is now of this generation that never saw the, the miracles that God did. That was three generations ago. He didn't see it. He said, and where are all his mercies, or his miracles rather, which our fathers told us about, saying, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. So then the Lord turned to him and said, go in this might of yours, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? And so he said to him, O oh my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is of the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, Surely I will be with you, and you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. Now, there's, there's a lot in this passage, but the first thing I want us to take note of is of who Gideon is talking. Who is this angel that is speaking? I've, I've talked about this before. The word angel in this passage, as in many other places, in Hebrew is malak. The malak of the Lord. It means messenger. It means envoy, an ambassador, a supernatural being that has the authority to speak for God. But notice in verse 11, it says, angel of the Lord came and sat under the, under the tree. In my Bible, and perhaps in yours, where it says the angel of the Lord, do you see the A is capitalized? So there's a capitalization going on there. The translators of the King James Bible, and probably really from the work of Tyndale, they understood that in the Old Testament, in certain passages where it talks about the Malach of the Lord, when you follow the narrative of the in, that individual occurrence and the story that follows with it, it is something very different than the run-of-the-mill angel that is a servant of God, a created servant being of God. The word malak is used many times in the Old Testament to describe an angel, but in special circumstances, it's different. In those special circumstances, the angel is not an angel in, in that typical sense that we think about it. It's not an angel at all. The special malach of the Lord appeared to Hagar, if you remember. And then after she interacted, interacted with that angel of the Lord, she realized that she had seen the Lord and lived. It wasn't just his messenger. It was the Lord himself. Abraham and Sarah also interacted in this special way with this special angel. And that angel appeared to Moses in the burning bush. The Malik of the Lord. The same individual each time. And so we realize in this narrative that a being of much greater importance than just an angel as amazing that may see, you know, be to, to see an angel, this is God himself interacting uh, with Gideon. And as we'll see in just a few verses, Gideon figures this out. He realizes what's going on. In fact, he starts to suspect it as they have this conversation. It's the same individual that Joshua knew as the commander of the armies of the Lord. A title, I think, that Gideon would have known very well. He would have known that from, from all of those stories that his fathers had told him. 
So then that leads us to the next point. And I think we need to recognize something important about Gideon. He's oftentimes looked at as being fearful, as being, uh, you know, just afraid and scared. And I've maybe thought about, thought that way about him in the past as well, that God took this fearful man that was hiding in a wine press, right, and made him into this courageous warrior that God could perform his redemptive work through and save Israel. And I understand why that seems to be the case, you know, because of how that story is. But I'm not entirely sure that that is a fair characterization of Gideon. Gideon was threshing wheat under cover of the wine press. Yes. But why was he doing that? Was it because he was fearful? Or was it because he was wise? Wise and an intelligent man. If he had decided, I'm going to just thresh this wheat out into the open, well, we get an indication from the scripture of what would happen. He was doing it to hide it from the Midianites. So if he was out in the open, the Midianites in all likelihood would have seen him, surrounded him, carried on making him thresh the wheat, and then once he's all done, take it from him and kill him. So was it fear? Was he being cowardly? Was he scared? Or was he being smart? <laughs> because he's one guy threshing wheat, right? And the Midianites were how many? Like locusts on the ground. So is it fair to look at Gideon as, as being fearful? Or really should we look at him as being smart? I think it's fair also to say that he was probably traumatized. If you think, you know, again, about how much Israel had gone through through seven years of this oppression and barely able to survive. And I'd like to know the backstory of how he managed to find some wheat. You know, and where did he grow it? <laughs> uh, you know, uh, maybe he snuck down and, and, you know, grabbed a few bushels or something and then, then ran off. I, I don't know, but we don't have that, that part of the story. But I don't think he was fearful or cowardly. Traumatized, yes. But he was smart. He was capable. He was a realist. He understood what it took to provide for himself and his family. He understood the circumstances and worked within that to provide. And as we'll see, he was just as God said he was, a mighty man of valor. Because it's also interesting in the exchange, he doesn't say, wait, who, who are you talking to? Mighty man of valor? He doesn't object to that term. Now, was it because he was so mesmerized by the individual he's just talking to? Or was it real? Did he know in his heart that he was courageous, that he was strong, that he could do something if he had the resources to do something? I think the idea that he was a fearful man, that God made great, is something that we like. It's a narrative that makes us feel better because we feel fearful at times. We don't always feel very courageous. And so we like the idea that God can take somebody that's fearful and, and make them strong. And indeed he can. But I think there's more to learn about Gideon and ourselves by looking at this story differently. To give an example of... Uh, of what I'm kind of driving at, I thought I'd draw from uh, contemporary storytelling. Is, everybody's heard of Captain America, right? Yeah? No? Some smiles. Come on, it's, it's okay to like Captain America. Maybe not everybody knows the backstory, but you know, the backstory of Captain America is, is this super skinny kid, right, from Brooklyn, and uh, he's a wimp, and he's got no muscles and no strength, 
but he has a courageous heart. And it doesn't matter if the person's three times bigger than him. If they did something wrong, he's going to let them know. And if they don't like it, well, he'll fight them until they're tired of knocking him down. And that's the kind of character that he starts out with. And then, of course, you know, he's injected with the magic serum and lots of power from the electrical grid. And I don't know how that works, but I'd like to get some. Um, and then what changes? What changes in the scenario? Does he become brave? He was already brave. Does he become more courageous? He was already courageous. What really happens? He becomes stronger. That's the only difference. He becomes physically strong. He's bulletproof, which is kind of cool. Um, but otherwise, his inner character, and that's kind of a fun part of the storyline of the scientist that picks him, is his inner character and nature, is that he's already courageous. He's already brave. He's just weak. And I think sometimes we look at ourselves that way. And we mistake our weakness for fear or a lack of courage or a lack of ability to endure. And that's not the same thing. Weakness is different. So I think this is how we should look at Gideon. That he was weak. Now, he wasn't a sickly weak guy. By, by all accounts. We read later that he was a physical warrior, right? And it takes a lot of energy and upper body strength to wield a sword or a spear. Those things are not light tools. But in the grand scheme of things, he was weak and he was one person. And so he was threshing wheat out of sight so that he wouldn't get overwhelmed by a group of people that would outnumber him. So let's look at Gideon that way. And then maybe let's also, as we look at Gideon that way, look at ourselves that way. So in verse 15, remember it says, O oh my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh. He didn't say, my, my clan is the yellowest or the scariest. Without, the, you know, without any courage, he said, it's the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, surely I will be with you, and you shall defeat the Midian, Midianites as one man. The least man of the smallest clan. I mean, that's, that's God's method, isn't it? He takes that time and time again. And he chooses oftentimes the weak. But I don't think he just chooses the weak because he thinks that they're without courage. I think it's the opposite. He does choose the weak to make them strong and to show his glory in them. But he doesn't choose those that don't have courage. And yet God told him, you are a mighty man of valor. You are a mighty man of valor. And that through this might, he might uh, bring about in him this, this uh, salvation to, to Israel and this leadership that Israel needed and would defeat the Midianites as though they were just one man. One-on-one -on -one combat. One man against one man. And you notice the difference between where you find Gideon. He's one man alone threshing wheat in a wine press, hiding because of the many. And God said, no, with me, I will make the many like one man to you, and you will take him out. That's what God was going to do with him. And that verse should also help us understand the courage was already in Gideon. I know of no time when any angel says that they will be with someone, Moses or Joshua and so on, if it was just a regular angel. 
And then when the Lord says, I will be with you. Every time God says that, it's him. Because the angel would have said, the Lord said, I will be with you. And so just like all the others, all the other courageous men and women, that God has said, I will be with you. It's from him directly as a promise. And I think Gideon suspected it. And I think that actually leads him to asking for a sign. Because, you know, after seven years of trauma, of oppression, he needed proof that God was going to be with him. And I think that's fair, right? Because God had not been with Israel. He hadn't because of their sin, but he had not been with them and protecting them. So if he's going to stick out his neck, he needed confirmation. And, of course, we know it's not the first time that he wanted confirmation. Or rather, it is just the first time that he wanted confirmation. It's not the last time that he asked for that. But he wanted confirmation that the one who he's talking to, the one that says you are a courageous man of valor, is actually a savior. Notice what he says in verse 17. Then he said to him, If now I have found favor in your sight, then show me a sign that it is you who talk with me. Well, who would that be? Who else could that be? He's wanting to know, is this you, God, Yahweh, the great I am? Are you talking with me? So he says, do not depart from here, I pray, until I come to you and bring out my offering and set it before you. And then he said, the angel, the Malik of the Lord said, I will wait until you come back. The notion of God sitting around and waiting for us. You know, think about that. The graciousness of God, the kindness towards this man. And of course, God had wanted to perform a work. He had a vested interest. But he didn't get mad. He didn't flare up and, you know, don't you know who I am? He was willing to let him work through this process and understand. And, you know, I imagine he's walking away and he's like, okay. I think this really is the God of our fathers talking with me here. <laughs> you know? This is really the captain of the Lord's armies. The one that was in the burning bush. I just wonder what was going through his mind. So he goes off. It says he went and prepared a young goat, an unleavened bread from an ephah of flour. And the meat he put in a basket. And then he put broth in a pot. And he brought them out to him under the, under the tree and presented, and presented it to, them, to him. And you think about this. There's a lot of things to think about. Goats were probably pretty rare. And he just sacrificed one. Or maybe they already, you know, slaughtered one and had some meat already. But th this is seven years of famine, essentially, of somebody else stealing all their food. This was a sacrifice. And then the bread made from the flour. You know, And then it took some time. He's baking some loaves of bread. He's preparing a broth and, and the meat. And he's probably thinking, I don't know, maybe he's thinking, I remember when, when Abraham sat down and had a meal with God. Maybe it'll be like that. Right? And so he's going to bring this covenant meal, and he's going to get his sign. And... And then I don't know what he thought after that. What happens next? So he brings it to the Malik of the Lord. It says, And the angel of the Lord said to him, Take the meat, the unleavened bread, lay them on this rock, and pour out the broth. And he did so. And then the angel of the Lord put out the end of the staff that was in his hand, and he touched the meat and the unleavened bread, and a fire rose out of the rock and consumed the meat and the unleavened bread. And the angel of the Lord departed out of his sight. Now Gideon perceived that he was the Malik of the Lord. 
He perceived it. He suspected it. And now this is for real. That he was the Malik of the Lord. So Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for I have seen the Malik of the Lord face to face. And then the Lord said to him, Peace be with you. Do not fear. You shall not die. You know, and that, that has happened so many times when this angel of the Lord appears. And I really think that, that God finds it funny in, in some way because he's appeared to them as not himself, you know, not in all of his glory. So you absolutely know from the beginning and then they figure it out by something that he did, something special that he did. And just the kind of playfulness almost in the moment. And then has to assure almost every time this happens, you're not going to die, don't worry. He's, that, that's exactly what happened with Hagar. And he said, peace be with you. Do not fear. You shall not die. So Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and called it, the Lord is peace. Yahweh Shalom. And that must have been just amazing to him. Because for seven years, they had not been receiving peace from the Lord. They had experienced brutality, death, starvation, all the things that come with not having food, not having shelter, not being safe. And now he's saying, we are getting peace back from God. He's at peace with us again. And it says to this day in Ophrah of the Azabazites, and that was, you know, at the time, still named for that place for what happened. That is the peace of the Lord, the peace of God. He knew who the Malik of the Lord was. He knew it all the way through. It was God himself. And he knew that nobody survives an encounter with the Malik of the Lord unless he comes in peace. You know, and it makes me think of uh, the scripture I just read a few weeks back, you know, that, that the, one of the names of our Savior is the Prince of Peace. And he comes to us in peace, hasn't he? He's come to each and every one of us in peace and called us by his name and made us his children. And so Gideon knew <laughs> who this person was. He did come to Gideon in peace and he accepted Gideon's offering and he was gracious to give him the sign to help him, to help him understand and encourage him and to know that he was really with him. Gideon knew the promises of God toward Israel and he was faithful even though he and the people had been in enduring all that trauma and all that struggle. There are many lessons I think we can take from this personally out there. So many personal lessons just in this very short passage, uh, just part of the story of Gideon. And in fact, you know, as I mentioned at the beginning, I wanted to give this, this uh, message as a way of encouraging our ladies to, to participate into the, the women's Bible study and, and also to remind those who tune, tune in online, we will actually be uh, streaming that Bible study uh, through Zoom as well, so that'll be available. But this story, as, as so many of the stories of the Old Testament, is, as we are told, are for our edification, for our education, for our strengthening and encouragement. And we, we should look at the story of Gideon in that way for us personally. Because from time to time, I think we all find ourselves threshing wheat in a wine press. You know? In different circumstances in life, we'll find ourselves, maybe not hiding, but, but yeah, hiding. We're trying to deal with something on our own, threshing wheat in a place that it wasn't supposed to be done and not being probably very successful, dealing with oppressive circumstances, 
by ourselves and not looking to God and not asking and, and maybe not expecting him to come help us. We all live with the consequences of our own sin, of the sin of others, of the trauma of living on planet Earth. And, you know, we, we've touched upon some of the stresses in our community for this year, but we are blessed. But even within our blessings, we have trauma. We all lose loved ones. We all lose security and safety at different times. We all have uh, loss in family. We have loss of health, anxiety, depression. All of those things are like trying to thresh wheat in a wine press when we try to do them in our own strength without God's aid and trying to do them in secret. We might feel like God has abandoned us. So why pray to him at all? I bet Israel felt like God abandoned them because he kind of had, right? Just out of sight. He was always watching them. But, but to them, their perspective, he was out of sight. And it took them a while to figure out what they needed to do for him to be able to come back and, and save them again. So what do we do? We try to get on as best we can, don't we? We try to get down in the wine press and thresh our wheat, hoping that nobody notice, notices not our fear, not our lack of courage, but our weakness to deal with the situations that we have in our life. And that is a trap. We would be trapping ourselves inside of that wine press. It's a very lonely place to be. And the story of Gideon shows us, though, that we're not alone. Gideon was doing this. He wasn't strong enough to, to thresh his wheat out in the open. He wasn't strong enough to, to provide out in the open. And we know why. Because the enemy was greater than him. And that was just the circumstances. But our enemy is not. And yet we oftentimes act like he is greater than us. And what does that scripture say? Greater is the one living inside of each of us than that is living in the world. God comes to us. And when he does, what does he say? Does he say, you coward? What are you hiding down here for? I don't think so. I think he says exactly what he said to Gideon. You mighty woman of valor. You mighty man of courage. I'm going to take you out of the wine press and perform a work in you that you have never even imagined. The Apostle Paul puts it this way when he's talking about a very very deep weakness that he has and we, we all wish that we understood exactly what it was that buffeted him but he said in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 7 he said and lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of revelations a thorn in the flesh was given to me a mess messenger of Satan to buffet me lest I be exalted above measure concerning this thing I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me and he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in my infirmities, in the reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, and in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. You know, some have suggested that the messenger of Satan, uh, you know, that imagery that he uses was, was actually a, a physical infirmity uh, to do with maybe blindness, you know, from, from that moment that he was on the road to Damascus and, and it eventually, you know, caused, caused blindness even though he was healed of it. But regardless of whatever it was, 
what, regardless of what that version of, of being weak was and being the smallest and without strength, regardless of what that was for Paul, he said he was weak. When he was weak is when he was strong. But he was never afraid. He was never without courage. And just think about this. What would the Christian church look like if Paul had stayed inside of his wine press? Because I suspect for Paul, his wine press was that he persecuted the church of God. And if he had recoiled in that, and if he had said, this is too big for me, I cannot, you know, if his response to the road of, uh, on the road of Damascus was, was to recoil and go inward and not follow God's plan for him, what would have the gospel looked like? What would have the church history looked like? We can thank God that by his grace, Paul picked up that high calling that God put into him. And he stepped out of the wine press and he went in boldness and in the, the strength that God gave him. And notice again what Paul says. He said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in my infirmities and reproaches in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And it just, it seems incongruent to the world. And it seems odd sometimes to our mind. But when we fully recognize our weaknesses, that is when God can work with us. It reinforces what we talked about earlier. That weakness is not the same as fear or lack of courage. In fact, when we finally come to a place where we realize that we are weak, that we don't have enough power to overcome the circumstances that we find ourselves in, it's then that we pick up the strength of Christ Jesus. It's then that we can work with the captain of the Lord's armies. The angel of the Lord can then work with us and we with him. And he can bring us to the place that he has designed for us to be. And that takes courage. It takes courage to deal with this one whom if we see in his natural state, we will die unless he comes in peace. I mean, it takes courage just to do that and to allow him to throw his light on our entire life and unearth everything in there that he needs to resolve with us. And then it takes courage to take that out into the world and share that with those that desperately need it. You know, we've talked at, in times in the past about the different resurrections that we see, the, at least two resurrections we see in Scripture. And the first resurrection, as we know, is, is to, to those that have lived through this world, through this life, and have overcome. Right? They, have ha they have the testimony of Jesus Christ, and they keep his commandments. And that is a special resurrection. It's a better, the scripture says, a better resurrection. And I think it's better because it is harder to be a believer in this world. It's harder to have faith in this age, in this time, than it will be in the kingdom of God. Are you kidding? <laughs> when God is ruling, when Satan is imprisoned for a thousand years, I know the, the people living at that time will, will certainly have their own human nature to, to, to challenge with. But to, to me, it's harder now. And that's why we are given a better resurrection, as the scripture tells us. And that takes courage. And there's 
not a single one of us who are here by mistake. When the invitations to God's kingdom were sent out, you did not receive somebody else's invitation, just in case you were doubting that. It had your name on it. As I think the Chosen uh, you know, series shows so well, that he called us by name, and we are his. And so we have this courage. He's already recognized it in us. Yes, we're weak. And we need his strength, just like Gideon. And we know that the promises of God, and we know of the wonders that he has done with our fathers, our forefathers, spiritual and physical. And we also know he will shake the earth again. And not just the earth, it says, but the heavens also. We will see his wonders. And he will deliver his people. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 32, we know this is the faith chapter. And of course, I had to go here because, well, Gideon's mentioned here. But I think it's just really appropriate for us to consider that we are here with Gideon. Breaking into the flow into verse 32, it says, And what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, and also of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouth of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle. Valiant. Valiant in battle. Men and women of valor. Turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. I knew I had it in here. A better resurrection. Still others had trial of mockings and scourgings, yes, and of chains and, imp and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were tempted, they were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, and tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. And all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. God having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us or without us. The writer of Hebrews puts us in this passage. And all we need to have is courage and faith in God. He brings the power. He brings the strength to our weakness. We should take encouragement from this. We should really just take encouragement from the story of Gideon and, and what that can tell us about who we are in God's eyes. We are called for a higher purpose. And maybe it's not in this life, maybe no presidents and kings in here, but we are called for a higher purpose. We are called to show the strength of God and let him replace our weakness with his strength. We're called to get out of our wine press. Get out of the wine press of our mind and fight alongside the angel of the Lord.